thank you and welcome everyone this morning. We heard a lot of political credentials, but we're really on our stage here. We're graced with the presence of great jugglers because they have great demands to fix infrastructure, to fix a lot of problems that have not been addressed for a long time. And they do have a deficit. I won't embarrass you with the numbers, but they're kind of big and they've got to juggle this. <laughs> So we're going to get a little uh, look at how they're going to manage this juggling act. But before we go there, I want to start with something that's uppermost on the minds of every Canadian this week, and that is the events of Wednesday, the tragic events. And both premiers made a decision to carry on with their governments. And I want to just ask both of you from a personal, political point of view, sort of where you were, how you made that decision, and what it meant to you to, to know that this great public space had been so invaded. And Premier Couillard, I wonder if I could start with you. You were two hours away from, mm -hmm. well, a few, more than a few hours, but close to, uh, close to uh, Parliament Hill. Um, the shooter was from your constituency. <coughs> Just tell us a little bit about where you were and what went through your mind and the decision that you made to carry on. Well, we, we were in Quebec City, of course, and we heard uh, as early as uh, at the same time that it was happening in Ottawa, those tragic events. That brought back memories because we had the tragic shooting uh, uh, 30 years ago in the National Assembly and, of course, other uh, horrific uh, days like Polytechnic and, and similar occasions. And our modern democratic societies uh, know this. But this is exactly what is at stake. I mean, these groups are violently opposed to the concept of a secular, open, democratic society. And this is what they are attacking. So if we hadn't set that day, we let them prevail, and they will not prevail. Democracy and freedom will, will, will win. And, and Premier, you responded very quickly and very assertively. Tell us sort of what went through your mind that day. Yeah, so first I want to, uh, I want to echo Premier Criard's uh, commentary off the top of his remarks in terms of um, just reaching out to and acknowledging the family and friends of the, um, of the young man who was killed and, and the, uh, the other victims. Um, it, was a, it was a very quick decision that we had to make because our question period started at uh, 10.30 in the morning and so the events were really unfolding as, uh, as we uh, went along. My, um, you know, my first thought was we have, to, we have to resist this. We have to uh, stand up and, uh, and uh, not be silenced was the language that I used in the, in the legislature. Um, I, what we did was uh, we met with, I met with the leaders of the opposition and uh, we had a, really a brief conversation because we were of, of one mind. And my, my feeling is that it is especially important um, within the parameters of safety. I mean, that was, that was what I was trying to balance was, is there any imminent threat um, listening to our security folks and, uh, and being responsible? But within those parameters, um, how, do we, how do we make it clear that we are going to carry on, that we are not going to be silenced? And, uh, and all of us in the legislature felt that it was very important that we continue the day and that we, uh, that we not be silenced. And as Premier Criard has said, I think that that is, that is the overarching stance that we need to take in the face of, uh, of this kind of violence. And how does our notion of public spaces, our public government buildings, change. I think it's so shocking how quickly one individual could get within literally feet of the most, within feet, several feet of our most senior political federal officials. Do we change the legislatures? Do we make them less open? Well, you know, and I will just say from our uh, perspective, the openness of the legislature has actually changed over time. It is not the same as it was when David Peterson was the premier, because I remember in those days that it, it was much easier just to walk in and out. So I would just say that there, there has been change over time. I think the challenge right now is to react appropriately, not to overreact, not to, uh, not to create a fortress, but to be responsible and to pay close attention to what the authorities know and to take advice from them. What I, what I am worried about is that we not get into a political debate in the, in the legislature or in the media about what we should or should not be doing. There are experts, there are professionals who will give us advice on these things and we need to take that advice. I don't think this should be an ideological battleground. This should be uh, decision making according to what the experts, experts know. Sure. 
Well, in our case, unfortunately, uh, security was upgraded in 1984 when we had this uh, shooting. For those who don't remember, there was a uh, solitary gunman that entered the assembly and actually killed people that day. And was, what a coincidence, was controlled by the sergeant of arms of the National Assembly. Uh, he didn't have to use violence, he just calmed him down because he saw that it was a military person and used his military experience to impose its will on him. And we saw the courage yesterday of a sergeant, uh, day before yesterday of Courage Sergeant of Arms Vickers in Ottawa. That's a strange connection between the two events. Uh, but again, security was significantly upgraded. People need to be able to see us. I like it when a citizen comes to me in the street and tells me his or her opinion about what we're doing. It's important that they can do this. But the world is changing, has changed. So the balance is very, very fragile. And I, I, we need to keep this in mind. But you know, the essence of who we are, I mean, it's interesting, Philip, you say that, people coming up to you on the street. So many times I have people who have come from other countries come and say to me, I would never see you walking on a street in my country. I would never see a minister or a premier in the community. And I, I think we lose that at our peril. I think it is definitional to who we are as Canadians. Mm -hmm. All right, well, so let's shift gears a little bit and talk about something that is on the minds of anyone that lives in major cities in Montreal, in, in, in Quebec, Montreal, and in, in Toronto, Ontario, and other cities, and that is infrastructure. Um, this week, Calgary's uh, uh, mayor, Nahid Nenshi, gave free political advice to all politicians, which is, you can win an election if you can fix the transportation problem. And <laughs> how long did it take you to get here? <laughs> um, it's a big issue, you got big deficits, um, how did we get into this mess? How did we go for so long without the infrastructure we need to support our cities and the commerce and the transaction of trade? First, we went through a phase in the 60s and 70s when we had to build fast, a significant amount of infrastructure. We had very little debt at that time, a lot of fiscal elasticity, if I can say so. So we went forward and did basically all we wanted to do. And the tragic thing that after that, we wanted to keep doing new things and maybe forgot or partly forgot to just maintain what we had. So we are facing now both a backlog of old infrastructure that needs to be maintained and need for new public transit, for example, infrastructures in our large cities. But coming to the comments of uh, the mayor of Calgary, it's true, but in my writing of Robert Val, which is rural, there are other ways to be elected than just uh, talk about transport. <laughs> and I, I would say, I, I would say the forestry industry is certainly one of them. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I, when I heard that comment, I thought, well, there's a bit more to it. <laughs> Given Ontario, look at the map of Ontario. Transit's not going to get it completely, but transportation infrastructure. I think what happened, it's interesting, all that building, I was with Premier Davis the other uh, day, and he told me he opened a school a day. <laughs> the whole time he was in office, you know, which is probably an exaggeration, but, but not much of an exaggeration. That period of growth that, uh, that we went through, in that period of growth, we established, I believe, Jackie, certain things that were going to be the ongoing projects. So if you look at roads in Ontario, we have always had a five-year, six, ten-year road building plan. We have an ongoing commitment to building and repairing highways. We haven't had that same kind of ongoing commitment to public transit, for example. We didn't see it as part of our core business. The Ministry of Transportation was called the Department of Highways. You know, that's, that's what it was. And so um, I think what we're, the period we're in right now, partly we're having to repair infrastructure that is all of a certain age, and uh, it's sort of the baby boom infrastructure that we're dealing with. Um, but we're also having to introduce into our, uh, our economic plans that ongoing investment in things that, that were not seen as, uh, as priorities in, uh, in the past. And that's a challenge because it means, if you think about transit, it means that we are disrupting when we're building in cities. So, you know, um, we really need to see some completion because although it's, uh, it's very important to getting elected, the actual process of building transit in our big cities, not so pretty, not so pleasant. So people get, you know, people react to that. So we're in a, we're in a, a very important moment where we have to establish that ongoing investment is important. The other part of this, and Philip and I have talked about this, 
having a federal partner in terms of the ongoing investment, having a national transportation and transit strategy is very important. Right now, we're, yes. We've committed $130 billion over the next 10 years, and you've committed 90, 90 billion dollars. So um, when you look at that kind of commitment, and then look at the federal commitment of $70 billion over the same time period, you can just see the gap in terms of commitment and adequacy. And so I would suggest that over years, we have not had an arrangement with the federal government that acknowledges that having ongoing transportation infrastructure and, and other infrastructure, quite frankly, has to be part of the business of the federal and the provincial and, quite frankly, the municipal governments. So you're both sitting here together and you're both examining the same problems, whether it's in the cities or in the rural areas. What, is, what do you think are some of your smartest strategies? Let's, let's share some ideas here of, of either how you fund, whether you dedicate funds so that it's locked in and you know that it can't be mixed. Give us a couple of your favorite ideas as to how you can really make a difference uh, on this issue. Maybe I, I would try to say that uh, we, look, we have to look at this from a different angle and use what is another potential crisis as an opportunity. Here I'm talking about the climate change issue. Uh, we know that the transport sector is a source of a significant part of the greenhouse gas emissions that we have in this country. So let's use this initiative and this opportunity we have to develop more infrastructures to do it smartly, put more emphasis on public transit, for example. Electrification of transport is also a way to achieve our targets while improving comfort and access for our citizens in cities. And at the end of the day, we will all benefit from it. As far as funding is concerned, this is where the two have to come together the fight against climate change, climate change and economic development. So as we probably know here in this room, Quebec has uh, started the uh, carbon trading system of California. We'll have our first uh, auction in November and we'll get roughly $3 billion of proceeds out of this between now and 2020. And we've put, we're putting all this in a green fund that is dedicated towards taking initiatives that will add to our strength in the fight against climate change. For example, new SMEs in green technology, but also more emphasis on electrification of transports and public transit. Otherwise, you know, fiscal reality being what it is, it's hard to see where new money is going to come from. Uh, and this is how I think we should join issues. Now in Ontario, we've experimented with public and private partnerships for Highway 407, which has helped relieve bottlenecks. Is that something that's going to work for the well, province? Well, our, yeah, our alternative financing um, program, so the AFP is the, you know, that is the model that in fact we, uh, we're talking in other jurisdictions about because it, it is allowing us to partner with the private sector to, uh, to have some of that risk borne by the private sector and to actually get the uh, infrastructure built that we need. And so we will we'll be continuing to look at how the AFP model can, uh, can support us in, uh, in building infrastructure. But the other piece you talked about, you both talked about dedicated revenue. Our green bonds, our, uh, our look right now at our assets so that we can recycle some of those assets, make them work for us, and put, uh, put some of that money in, put, put that money into uh, a Trillium Trust so that we have it as a steady stream of income to, uh, to build infrastructure. Those are things that are very important. I think the other thing is innovation, and I, um, you know, sometimes when we think about innovation, we, we think narrowly, and uh, I think we have to think broadly. So there's, there's innovation in infrastructure, that infrastructure building that's very important, and I, I know the Minister of Transportation is somewhere, and uh, there he is back there. Um, but, you know, the, the innovation that's going on in our construction and our, uh, our transportation sector is very important. So, you know, you drop in a, a bridge in a, a four or five day period, that was something that used to take months, that kind of innovation helps us as we, uh, as we make these investments. So all of that, all of that has to be worked on. Do you look to any particular cities or regimes? Um, all over the world, people are experimenting with this issue. In London, they've pretty well cut yeah. off um, downtown traffic, or you're have, you pay for that privilege yeah. of traveling downtown. Is that something that we need to think about? In our provinces. We, need to, we need to look at all of the models that are being used uh, around the world and, and apply them to our particular circumstances. But I think we can't, we can't just look within ourselves. We have to look at where, uh, where infrastructure is being built. How is that happening? Why can one country do it and we, uh, we are not? But you know, remember that in most of those instances, there's a federal 
partner. There's a, there's a national strategy and a national commitment, and that, uh, that's often the missing, the missing link for us. And also those uh, cities, uh, London, uh, Stockholm, Copenhagen, look at this regionally. Uh, we have unfortunately a tendency to look at that bridge or that highway and never have a broader view of the uh, congestion issue, for example, how to address it jointly in a regional way. So as long as we don't do this, it's going to be hard to have a very good conversation on that because we have now a, 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 an environment in which we focus on Champlain Bridge in Montreal. That's the only issue. Well, it's not the only issue about transport in, in, in transportation in Montreal. We have to look at it regionally and look at what others are doing, where they have failed, where they have uh, succeeded, and try to follow their path, but uh, prudently and with citizens. It's, it's important. And I, you know, I think that's why these conversations are important. I had the opportunity to meet with uh, a number of regional mayors from this area yesterday. And I think, because of some of the planning changes that we have made, I think that regional consciousness is growing here. It's not easy, because there has been so much local autonomy. But it's something that uh, absolutely has to happen, particularly in the GTHA and the Niagara region. All right, let's go to the other side of the ledger, which is liabilities, um, which is if you are going to spend, what are you going to have to cut, in effect, given the, the scale of the deficits today? And Premier Couillard, you came out very strong shortly after you were elected, talking about wage freezes and the burden of the sort of the public sector payroll. Um, I think you said equaling the cost of running the schools in the province. It's yeah, a very... Our debt, our uh, debt uh, payments yes. are more than what we give our, our grade schools and high schools in Quebec today, $10 billion. So we have to start the year by spending $10 billion less than we earn just to balance the budget because of that loan. So that's important. So tell us what some of your key strategies are. It's been a few months now, <laughs> um, and you've got to focus on how you're going to do that. What are, what are some of your priorities in that? Uh, addressing liabilities, you mean, yes. essentially. Uh, yes. this, the spending side and the yes. long-term yeah. spending yes. side. Okay. So I think pension, the pension issue is certainly at the forefront of our uh, conversations and reflections. Uh, we have had the opportunity of having a very good report in Quebec called the Damo Report. I hope some of you can access it that look at this issue, you know, defined contribution, defined benefits uh, schemes, et cetera. And we basically followed the recommendations and addressed initially the uh, municipal pensions uh, that we have in Quebec that are some of them, not all of them, but some of them significantly underfunded. And we've passed the days where we could say, you know, around the negotiating table, well, let's ignore this issue for this time and the, the markets will solve it for us. Well, looking at the markets uh, those days, it's hard to believe that this will happen. So we re really, de really decided to address this head on. And we are legislating on that uh, with some very sound principle. For example, a 50-50 share of past and future uh, deficits. Uh, look at ways to negotiate clauses like indexation and other technical issues in pensions. But also at the forefront, the issue of the taxpayer. As I've been saying politically many times, you know, it's the municipality and the union. But I say there's a third player there that nobody talks about. It's the taxpayer at home receiving the tax bill to fund what those two will decide around the negotiating table. So we, are, we have to think about that. Now, on the issue of defined contribution or defined benefit, it's, it would be very easy to just say with a stroke of a pen, let's get rid of all the defined uh, benefit uh, schemes. But the Moore report and other reports show that you end up transferring those people sometimes on the public payroll as well because of the lack of support in their old age. So there's a more creative way of doing this and try to protect this for the next generation of workers, but again by making it more, work better, more balanced, and more responsibly, and always with the taxpayer at the center of our intention. It is very interesting to hear a political leader say that because it's a long-term project to do that. And so many of your predecessors have kicked the can down mm -hmm. the road. And in the private sector as well, we've seen that with pensions. Um, and it's a very difficult and emotional issue yeah. uh, for either the taxpayer or yeah. for the employee. Realistically, what do you think you can achieve in your term? Do you, would you like to legislate new terms so there's more shared risk in the pension plans mm -hmm. so that they're more sustainable over the long run? Well, we are legislating as we speak. And this bill, of course, one cannot presume of the uh, works of the parliaments, but uh, will likely be adopted. And this, then it will bring balance to municipal pension. Then we'll have to address uh, provincial pensions, where, which are not, by the way, underfunded, but need to be looked at. Uh, universities, private sector. 
We've added the possibility for employers like people in this room to have a voluntary uh, pension uh, joint, jointly fund uh, program uh, in, in their businesses. So that's how we look at it again in the long term. One value, you know, we, we try to govern around values. Uh, one value that our party added a few years ago under the impulsion of our youth wing is to add the value of equity between generations. And we, when we make decisions, we try to bring this in the reflection. How is this going to affect our children? Uh, and the, the pension issue is obviously one of them. So the interesting thing about the pension issue, and we're all taxpayers in this room, I think the debate today is, I'm a taxpayer. I'm paying for public sector pensions that I'll never have because 60% of Canadians don't have pensions. Kathleen, how do you address that? How do you address that debate? So we want, you want to talk about pensions as opposed to... We'll, we'll get back, we'll to, get, get back to... Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, they're related. I mean, as, as uh, Premier yeah. Couillard has done, they're, they're yeah. connected. Um, you know, I think that uh, we have to recognize that the vast majority of people don't have access to a pension. That's why, as you know, Jackie, we've made the decision that we've made in terms of the Ontario Retirement Pension Plan. We have to do it fairly. I mean, I know there are people in this room who probably have differing opinions, and it's going to be a discussion as we move to 2017. But um, on the point that uh, Premier Couillard has made, we have to make sure that public sector pensions are uh, are fair, but the reality is that um, we want everyone, whether they're working in the public sector or whether they're working in the private sector, to have a decent retirement. You know, we don't want people living with insecurity in their retirement. I mean, that, that sounds altruistic. It's actually not. It's actually self-interested because all of us know that if people are living um, without the, the means that they need, then, then the government is going to have to step in. They will have to be supported in some way. So, so it is in all our best interest to make sure that we rationalize pensions to the best of our ability and make sure there is some, um, some uh, equity in the, the, uh, the, the share that's paid. But at the same time, make sure that people who don't have access to those public sector pensions, that they have access to a, to a decent retirement. Our choice would have been, and I, you know, I, I know that this has been a conversation across the country, our choice would have been to have the federal government work with us on, uh, on CPP. That wasn't going to happen. Um, at least up to this point it hasn't happened, and so that's why we're moving ahead with the, uh, the ORPP. But we're also, to the, to the, the first point that uh, Premier Couillard made, we're also, um, and Deb Matthews is, as the President of Treasury Board is engaged in this, looking at where we can constrain spending and where we can make those decisions, some of them difficult in terms of post-retirement benefits, that actually they do save money, they don't create a, 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 a real hardship for <coughs> employees, but it means that we have a, a more just system going forward. So given all these burdens and the need for reform and repair and adjustment, they're all, they're all things that do cost money um, over time, in Ontario, what do you think are your most potent strategies for reducing the deficit? So there isn't a single thing, you know? It, there's, a, there's a multifaceted approach. So we know we have to constrain spending. That's why we have a newly created president of the Treasury Board um, who is looking at not just, not just program spending, but also um, salaries and benefits in the, you know, in the coming uh, collective bargaining processes, making sure that we are working with our partners to, uh, to uh, find ways of having net zero increases, which is not going to be easy because we, we have already been through a period of restraint and we're going to be, uh, we're going to be having you know, challenging conversations at the bargaining table, but I'm convinced we're going to be able to do that. Um, looking across government, again, we are not taking a, a, a cut and slash approach across government, but we know that constraining spending, keeping the, uh, keeping the costs, the increases to health care, for example. I mean, health care is nearly 50% of our budget. We have to constrain spending in health care. And what that means is doing things differently. And sometimes that's double speak for politicians of, you know, doing more with less. I don't mean that. I actually mean 
finding ways to help people to stay in their homes, um, making sure that people are taking the right medications in the right quantity, making sure that people who, uh, who need service are getting it, that people are getting the service that they need, not more than they need, not less than they need, and where they need it. That actually has the benefit of saving the system money. So those are, those are changes we know we have to make. Um, we did write into our budget some increases in revenue. Uh, we, we acknowledged that there were some areas that we needed to, uh, to increase revenue and look at our assets to optimize the income from those and to be able to recycle some of that. Uh, some of that. So we're doing a whole number of things that uh, have kept us so far and will keep us on uh, track to eliminate the deficit by 2017-18. And we're going out a little bit farther than, uh, than Quebec. We've got a slightly different fiscal situation. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, we, we acknowledge that it is we acknowledge that it's serious. We also acknowledge that the need for investment and support and partnership with business is important. Premier? Well, it, it, it is important to say that uh, growing the economy is part of the equation of, the fi of public finances. So you have to achieve a good mix. And all countries and states around the world are looking at this and grappling with this difficulty of combining. I don't like the word austerity. I like discipline better, for whatever reason. So budgetary discipline and growth. You have to do it at the same, not one after the other. You have to do both at the same time. Now, you know, yes, saying you know, doing more with less is kind of counterintuitive. And we, I like to say doing better or new with less. That, because the days before where we could count on a four, sometimes 5% growth of nominal GDP are behind us. Now we're looking at 3%, maybe more if we, if we have a good year. So it's a totally different environment. And in our case, the reason we have to do it faster and we, will, uh, we want to achieve a balance by 1516, is that we don't, want, we don't have as much elasticity, if I can say so, that Ontario has. Our gross debt to GDP ratio is at 54%. And we're about 41. And our tax burden is very high. And uh, any, what we have for federal transfers will most likely remain the same. So we've talked about growth. That's important. Looking at expenses now. We've decided, uh, as soon as we came into office, to set up uh, two commissions. One would look at our tax policy, which is a significant issue, both for businesses and individuals. And we'll start implementing the first recommendations between now and our, our next budget. And of course, in our next budget, there will be many of those. The other one, look at programs. And the way I look at it, first you have to tell people how you're going to do it and how you go on thinking about that. We've had the uh, habit of debating about structures. Let me give you an example that will resonate in this room. Our governance structures in the regions for local and regional economic development, supporting SMEs, for example, locally. Everybody talks about this or that organization that we've put together in the recent years. So we've added layers of bureaucratic complexity, forgetting about the mission. The mission is what? To give the entrepreneur somebody to talk to who's going to make his or her life better and easier. So as soon as we find out that we don't need that much structures, then we can remove them, and we are removing them. So we'll do the same in healthcare, in education, in the regional economic development. First, defining the mission, kind of a zero budget type of approach. What do we need to do this? Oh my God, we have three times more than what we would actually need to do this. So let's get rid of the extra two thirds. So that's the way we do it. And I would end by quoting three numbers uh, that I've been uh, repeating during and after the campaign that reflect, reflect Quebec's economic and financial story. 20, 23, 26. So of course, we are 23% of Canada's population, but we only generate 20% of the wealth generated, generated in this country, which is not sufficient compared to our demographic weight. But our provincial expenses are roughly 26% of Canada's provincial expenses. So you see that the three numbers don't work together. So we have to bring that, bring that closer to the middle, not necessarily at the middle, because we do recognize that Quebec had certain I mean, missions and responsibilities that, for example, in the areas of culture, the areas of international representation, we want to keep. But this being said, we have to bring this back to balance there. Finally, I will say that the way we're going to approach the, the budget issue is probably 85% at least on the expense side. Easy to increase taxes, uh, you know, and you can do again with a stroke of a pen. But people want to see us as they tell us and we were talking about citizens coming in the street to, to talk to me. Well, please clean up your own house before you come and pick more money in my pockets. That's what I've been hearing. That's what I'm going to do. 
So I'm going to show them that the vast majority of the work that will have been done will have been done on the government side, trying to protect services, particularly for vulnerable people in our society, but going after structures. And we started with healthcare. We're getting rid of the regional governance layer, layer totally. We've got the ministry and local institutions, that's it. Same with schools, same with economic development. So both Quebec and Ontario are huge owners of crown corporations and businesses. You know, you look at Ontario Hydro, you look at uh, uh, Quebec Hydro. Have you ever thought of selling Ontario Hydro to Quebec Hydro? They do a much better job <laughs> running the business. For, for a good price, we'll take it. <laughs> Well, I know Ed Clark, Ed Clark spoke to uh, the room yesterday, and uh, so I think people here know <coughs> that we're very serious about making sure that those assets are working for the people of the province. And, uh, you know, he's actually talking about um, some sale of, uh, of part of uh, Hydro One and the opportunity that that could provide. Um, so I'm not ideologically opposed to either, you know. I think that what we need is a practical solution to the challenges that are in front of us. And one of the challenges in front of us is that we've got assets that probably are not working to their optimal capacity. And so that is exactly why uh, the, the advice that he's giving us, and I just, you know, I just say to the people in this room, and I spoke to some of the, the wine folks last night, some of whom are thrilled about what Ed Clark is saying and some of whom not so thrilled, I get that. Um, but you know, we need to find a way to make practical, to take t practical steps. And uh, we will do that. We will do that because I believe there are solutions. I believe there are ways of, of investing in the new assets that we need. The Ontario government is always going to own assets. It's just, are we owning the right assets at the right time in our history? And I would suggest right now, we need transportation infrastructure. Those are the new assets that we really need to, uh, we need to invest in, and so we've got to find ways of, uh, of doing that. I just want to pick up, too, on something that uh, Premier Cuillard said, and you didn't use this word, but the, uh, the productivity gap, you know? Um, we're in a very important moment in Ontario, and I think to some extent uh, Quebec might be in the same position, because we have these diverse economies where manufacturing was definitely, uh, is definitely a huge part of uh, who we are. But we have to work with business to make sure that we are as productive as we can be. And sometimes that means painful transition. You know, if we look at the auto sector, and we were talking earlier about forestry, making investments in the technology and the practices, and I look to Kevin Lynch, because he's talked to us about this many, many times from the Jobs and Prosperity Council, but making those investments that are going to allow us to compete globally and allow us to uh, work at capacity. Not easy, because there's a period of time where you're moving from the older to the new, and that, that creates training challenges because it means there are people who are moving from one kind of employment to another and sometimes often there's not a one to one match and we you know we have to be honest about how we help people make that transition but if we don't make that transition we're not going to compete globally because you know we're going to go we're going to go to china and we're going to see an economy that is doing everything it can and has to to be the best in the world you know they are just leaps and bounds. Um, they're doing whatever they need to do. And you know we're not in the same political position. We're not in the same uh, geopolitical place as they are. But we have to do in our province and in our provinces what's necessary to make us uh, that engine of uh, the Canadian economy. I do want to narrow in on the point of private privatization. Will we see privatization, uh, more privatization in this province and can you give us an idea of the scale of it? Well, Ed Clark has talked, uh, and again, he hasn't finalized his report. He's talking about uh, some of the distribution system, that um, he thinks that there's an opportunity there for us to, uh, to realize some, uh, some capital, and in fact, to improve service to, uh, to ratepayers, you know? And that's, for me, that's, a, that's a, a real sweet spot. If we can improve service and we can um, recycle an asset, I'm not, uh, I'm not opposed to doing that. And in Quebec? Yeah, br just briefly, if you allow me to go back on, on the issue of structural challenges for Quebec, the one that I forgot to add in the list, which is very significant, and probably one of the reasons we see Quebec recovering at, uh, recovering at a slower rate than our neighbors is demography. Uh, for the first time this year, 
the number of people between the ages of 16 and 64 is going to go down in Quebec compared to the year before. Never happened before. So we, of, as course, of course, as we all know, we introduced significant, I would say, family-friendly policies in the recent years that will have their impact. But immigration is absolutely essential to our economic future. That's the other part of the equation I wanted to put there. Now, coming back to Crown Corporation's uh, ownership. You know, it's, it's a, always a fashionable subject. You know, it, and uh, again, I have no ideological blockage you know, on this. So each time we looked at this, both for the liquor board, which is a SAQ in our case, and Hydro-Quebec, each time we walked away. Because when we looked at the hard numbers in terms of recurrent revenues, it wasn't so advantageous. Of course, it's a good one-shot deal, a one-shot injection in, in the uh, public finances. But after that, what you lose also has to be put in, in the balance for the next 20, 25 years. There are also uh, regulatory and tax uh, fiscal challenges. For example, Hydro-Quebec and other Crown Corporation you basically cannot sell more than 10% of ownership if you don't want to incur significant tax consequences. So are we going to add all the burden, administrative burden in Hydro-Quebec to manage 10% of public ownership for only 10%? You know, what's, what's the trade-off here? And just briefly on the liquor board, because this is sensitive, because people say, and frankly, as a citizen, even myself, I ask, my, you know, what does the state have to do with selling wine and alcohol, frankly. Now, I live in a small region, uh, Saint Felicien, Lac Saint Jean. You should go there; it's very nice. <laughs> we don't make wine yet, but you know, wait a few years. So we can are, sell you some. <laughs> we, we do buy it. So we, we are 10,000 of 10,000 of us there, and lots of small towns around. So and people get access through the uh, SAQ to a good quality of product and a good supply. And as you know, we Quebecers like Ontarians like that quite a lot. Not too much, hopefully, but just, <laughs> just enough. So that's also part of the equation for me. And we've tried to transform the SAQ in a more business-like organization. If you walk in a SAQ shop, and I'm sure probably the same LCBO, it's like it could be a private, uh, privately owned yeah. business. It just works the same way. It doesn't have the same costs, so we have to say that, frankly. But as far as being friendly to the consumer and a, a nice place to be in, I think we've, we've done significant progress. So as long as the numbers don't change and we keep looking at this regularly, uh, I think we're going to be very prudent with this. And that was, that was one of the principles that we, um, we gave to Ed Clark in his work, is you know, we, we are not interested in foregoing re that revenue stream. And so that's why we're not, we're not selling off the LCBO, we're not doing those things, but we do think that there are ways we can we can make the assets work better for people. All right. So they're standing there. We're out of time. I think this is an extraordinary gathering of two premiers. Already? I hope it's the beginning of a, of a great friendship. And I would uh, we'll say continue. a block of not only friendship, because I do enjoy my relationship, professional relationship with Kathleen quite a lot, and our teams are working well together. It is the return of the block of influence that Central Canada has always been in our country. And I think we should all be happy about that. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you.